Today is a sad day for LG fans and for smartphone fans in general. The company confirmed very late on Easter Sunday that it is officially and finally giving up on the mobile phone business. The broad strokes of the announcement are pretty straightforward. Existing LG phones will continue to get after sales support and software updates, at least for a while. Exactly how long depends on where you live, and LG will inform people about that when they can. Meanwhile, retailers and carriers that still have LG phones in stock will keep selling them, possibly with some big discounts involved. And the company plans to finish winding down its mobile division by the end of July 2021. LG's announcement was honestly pretty light on the human factor, so I briefly spoke to Ken Hong, LG's global head of communications, a few minutes after the news went live, and the tone of the conversation was surprisingly upbeat, all things considered. He admitted that the news was certainly disappointing, but the company had to do what was in the best interest of its employees and shareholders, though with that in mind, we're not sure to what extent layoffs will be a part of this plan. He concluded our chat by saying that as other brands have already shown, this business, the smartphone business, is a numbers game, not a popularity contest. And man, ain't that the truth. But even with that in mind, I still, I can't think of another high profile smartphone brand that just disappeared entirely. After its disastrous deal with Microsoft and Windows Phone, Nokia continued as a company purely focused on networking equipment, but it granted HMD a license to develop and sell Nokia smartphones. They're pretty good. You can go and buy one right now. Meanwhile, HTC, which was always my favorite OEM, they sold most of their smartphone business to Google, and these days they spend basically all of their time working on its Vive VR headsets, but even they still find time to churn out a phone or two in its native Taiwan. Unless something drastic happens, and soon though, I don't think we can expect the same from LG, and that is honestly a shame. The writing has been on the wall for a while for anyone who bothered to pay attention, but the official decision is still kind of a blow. I mean, personally, I was hoping that Google would swoop in and buy LG's smartphone division so it could blend the sort of purity and, and panache of the Pixel software experience with LG's knack for building really interesting devices like the LG Wing and that rollable phone, but clearly those kinds of deals just weren't meant to be. LG has never been the biggest, most important smartphone maker out there, but I have long believed that more competition is better for all of us. It forces smartphone makers to innovate faster and to make those innovations more affordable. And for the longest time, I look, I guess I just sort of assumed that a company as big as LG and with LG's resources would stay in the game indefinitely. So. I guess time really does come for us all. But instead of being glum about it in my basement like I just sort of naturally am, let's instead take a few moments to remember some of the truly great and truly wild phones LG has made over the years. To start, I wanna get a little personal. Before I worked at Engadget, I worked at a website called TechCrunch. And before that, I sold phones at Best Buy in college. And a lot of them were LGs. If you could have your perfect cell phone, what would that do for you? The ones that most quickly spring to mind are devices like the LG Envy series and the LG Voyager, both of which introduced a generation of mid-2000s teenagers to the joys of texting on tiny physical keyboards. If you weren't around at the time, please just take my word for it. These things were everywhere, at least in the US. The first LG smartphone that really caught my attention was the LG G2, which paired great specs for the time with a beautiful IPS screen, which at the time were relatively uncommon, and more important to me at least, had volume and power buttons on the back. It's 2021, and I still want a smartphone maker to do this. And sort of on a related note, the LG G2 Mini, that phone's sort of tinier sibling, that was the very first phone I ever gave the hands-on treatment to when I was starting out at Engadget. So, yeah, kind of a bit of personal history here. Before long, LG was tapped to make Nexus phones for Google, including the Nexus 4, the Nexus 5, and finally, the Nexus 5X. If you don't remember, these phones were relatively cheap and were best known for their pure Google software experience. So they definitely also came with some distinct quality control issues. I remember loving my plasticky, squarish Nexus 5 and using it right up until it got stuck in a boot loop like so many other LG phones of that generation did. 
Still, some of the things LG and Google cooked up for their last collaboration, the Nexus 5X, like that rear-mounted fingerprint sensor, that stuff would become a hallmark of the Pixel smartphone line when it debuted a year after the Nexus 5X. Any list of impressive LG phones has to include the G5, the world's first truly and properly modular smartphone. If you wanted physical controls for the camera or a dedicated digital to analog converter for better music quality, you could have it whenever you wanted. You just remove the battery, snap off the chin, plug in the accessory you needed, plug the whole thing back into the phone, and then turn the phone back on again. Not the most elegant process in the world, but damn it, it was a taste of a flexible smartphone future that we could have had if LG just committed to it. Oh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that the G5 was the very first phone I ever used with two rear cameras, a standard and an ultra wide. And these days, that's basically the bare minimum for a modern smartphone. LG was right there at the beginning. The G5 probably represented LG at its most weird, but the years that followed still had plenty of memorable moments. I remember having dinner in a multi-level restaurant of some kind at Mobile World Congress, and I dropped an LG G6 off a balcony down one story onto a tile floor, and the thing was in perfect shape. I'm still astonished by that. A former LG PR person snapped a photo of me on a stationary bike while testing the LG G8's time of flight gesture controls, a concept Google tried to run with in the Pixel 4. And I will never forget strapping the LG G8X into a dual screen case for the first time to play a game with controls on that second display and wondering if LG's team was onto something big. Turns out they weren't, but you've got to give them credit for trying. And really, that's the legacy that LG leaves behind. They always tried. None of the phones I just mentioned were perfect, but even though it was eclipsed by the competition, LG just kept at it year after year, and it pushed its share of envelopes along the way. If anyone from LG happens to be watching, honestly, thank you for all the fun. You did some good work over the years. And while I have you, if you have any insider insight into how all of this went down, you know where to find me. For everyone else watching, thank you so much for spending a little time with me to eulogize a company that has actually come to me more to me than I actually ever noticed. For everyone else, thank you for watching and spending a little time while I reminisce about the good old days with LG. We'd love to hear about your experiences and your favorite LG phones of the past, plus any feedback you have about this video. Leave it in the comments below. We really appreciate your support. We'll see you next time. And seriously, pour one out for LG today if you can. You know, phones these days do so much more. Internet, emails, camera, GPS, text messages. They're really your lifeline to so many things. The biggest thing for Best Buy Mobile is that you can look at AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. We're very familiar with the activation systems, the features, the pricing, the plans.